Shall we rise up to pray? A great God in heaven, we do thank you for our Bible study. Thank you, Lord, because even though today over here it has rained, yet you have brought us together. We are praying, Lord, that you open our eyes to see great, wonderful things out of your word tonight. In Jesus' name, I will pray, Lord, that the grace to abide by your word and to obey the things you are teaching us from day to day. We pray your grant to every one of us in Jesus' name. As we obey your word, we know that our lives will be better. Our families will be happier. And the church of the living God will be edified. Well, Lord, we are praying today that everything that we study will not overlook, but will apply to every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, to manifest the attitude of true children of God, wanting to learn, wanting to hear, wanting to obey. I will pray, Lord, that everything there is in your word for every one of us, you will grant us to be able to assimilate even tonight in Jesus' name. Breathe upon your word and teach us what we need to know. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. We can sit down. We come to our study tonight. And we're looking at Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, I'm reading to you from verses 1 and 2. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Judge not that she be not judged. For with what judgment she judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. As we look at those words, I'm sure you are familiar with those words. If you came last month, even if you didn't come, you've heard it before, judge not. Those gracious words of Jesus Christ are often casually quoted, carelessly quoted. When an evildoer, a sinner, a criminal, an offender, a backslider, when he does something and is confronted, you hear him saying, but Jesus said, judge not. Instead of having the desire to repent or turn around, they glibly respond and say, judge not. You see many people in their ignorance use those words of Jesus Christ to cover up their evil deeds and they continue in their evil ways that will lead to destruction. All the same, we need to learn that this uh, judgmental attitude, critical attitude is very common in society. And it is what brings uh, society into ruin and destruction. It is what spoils our friendship and fellowship. It is what destroys the church and it is what destroys the families. Judging, judging and judging. And many people that judge like that. They resent other people judging them. They recoil from other people judging them. It's very, very painful to them when others judge them. But they're very quick to judge. And the Lord is telling us one of the reasons why we shouldn't judge. That is judge hastily. Judge rashly. Or judge presumptuously. Or judge officiously. As if somebody has made you the chief judge in the community. The Lord is telling us not to judge so quickly. And reaching a conclusion on the lives and the character and the behavior of people. Without every, any evidence that you ought to have. In fact, he tells us in verse 2. It says, for with what judgment ye judged, ye shall be judged. It's saying that you must remember uh, there are people that are around you and you watch your character. If you have a judgmental spirit, a critical spirit, always jumping on others, criticizing others, condemning others, always calling people down. It says the measure that you use in measuring with other people to other people, it shall measure to you again. Judge not that you be not judged. That is to attract a lot of judgment. Judgment, criticism unto yourself, destructive criticism. If you yourself you are given to the habit of critically judging other people, and then he tells us with what measure you meet. 
it shall be measured to you again have you noticed when you're critical in the family and you comment negatively on everything looks like you know your wife will pick that up and the children will pick that up and the neighbors will pick that up and with the same measure you meet unto other people the same measure it will be meted unto you have you noticed that it also affects the children one to the other if daddy and mommy are judgmental and critical you're going to plant a poisonous seed in the family and the children are going to be judgmental and critical as well and then they'll be judgmental and critical about everything you do everything you say every way you appear that's why the lord is saying don't sow this poisonous seed of judgmental attitude so that you'll not be reaping something negative what you don't want to reap we're told in james chapter 2 james chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 13 james chapter 2 verse 13 for he shall have judgment without mercy that has showed no mercy and mercy rejoices against judgment it says if you're always critical you're going to reap what you sow and if you're always judgmental always looking at the negative side of everything of everyone it's going to be like that for you by the way you understand when you sow only one seed you reap in multiple fold you you sow the wind and you reap the wild wind you sow something very small and then you reap something very great a great harvest and it says for he shall have judgment without mercy that showed no mercy and mercy rejoices over judgment we're told in galatians chapter 6 galatians chapter 6 i'm reading from verse 7 galatians chapter 6 verse 7 i'm sure you're opening your bibles with me be not deceived don't deceive yourself cajole yourself and don't think no it will not come back I can throw a lot of stones on other people, houses, and puncture holes in their roof. And then nobody will ever do that to me. Deceive not yourself. Be not deceived. I can judge other people and they don't have uh, the ability and the wisdom to be able to judge me. Be not deceived. I can be very critical going through life. And then look at every negative side of every everything I see. And it will never be done to me. It says, be not deceived. I can do mine so cleverly and so wisely and so craftily that nobody will be able to detect it and do it again to me. It says, be not deceived. If you sow it, you'll reap it. Because there's a law of sowing and reaping. That's why it says, judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, it shall be judged against you. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. Be not deceived, therefore, God is not much. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. As we come back to Matthew chapter 7, and we're looking at those words again. We're looking at them in the context of what Jesus Christ has said. You need to read everything that Jesus said in the context of everything that he has said. Verses 1 and 2 in the context of verses 3 to 5. If you don't do that, you're going to misinterpret what Jesus has said. And you're going to say, well, that means I should just shut off my mouth. Whatever is happening around me, I should never correct anybody. I should never rebuke anybody. I should never say, why are you doing that? I should never instruct anybody. I should just, you know, keep mom and keep quiet. No, he doesn't say that. Come back to verse 1 of chapter 7 of Matthew. Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye, ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And then he goes on to verses 3 to 5. We'll say that another time. These words of the Lord Jesus Christ have also been misunderstood and misapplied by some leaders and teachers in our modern society. They maintain that human nature is sense correction and that no one ever changes his behavior because we want him to change. There's an aspect of psychology 
There's an aspect of a philosophy. And when you bring those two things together, there are some people that have gone so deep into the philosophy and psychology of human behavior. And they said they have studied it very well. And they said, correcting people does not pay. And then telling people that that is not tried, that should not be done. They say it doesn't pay because nobody wants to change. And until somebody wants to change and he makes up his mind to change, he will not change. Therefore, they say, keep him in darkness. Leave him alone. Don't talk to him. After all, didn't Jesus say, judge not? In fact, they teach that correction in any form is useless and that it accomplishes nothing except to harden the sinner. They say when you correct people, it doesn't do any good. It just hardens them. Makes them to want to do that again. Of course, I'm sure you know, there's some people in this world that they'll never listen to any correction. We know that. You know about Judas Iscariot. How many times did Jesus say, one of you is going to betray me. And it were better for that person to have been born. In fact, it were better a millstone were hanged upon his neck and he'll be drowned. And then he warned him over and over and over. And he, he never yielded to correction. We know that. We know there are some few people in society. They are hardened by correction. But don't tell me that we should not correct everybody. But James and John, they said something. And Jesus said, you don't know of what spirit you are. Don't say that again. They said, yes, sir. They listened to the master. And then Peter did something. And Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. That's, uh, you know, telling him that what he did, what he said was wrong. And Peter did not say that again. Yes, we know there's a few people that whatever correction you give them, they're not going to obey. We cannot pass that as a general principle. And you cannot say that from the words of Jesus Christ when he said, judge not. Well, soon notice what he meant and learn what he meant so that you can divide the words of truth and right. You need to study yourself. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But you see, these psychology teachers and uh, these philosophers, they say any form of judgment, even by the judges of the world, is contrary to the teaching of Christ. They're dreaming of a world where judge not will be absolutely and universally practiced. They hope for a civilization where there will be liberty for all children and all people to do as they please without judging anyone. By the way, it is a psychological kind of a background that makes the people to say, there's no corporal punishment in schools. That teachers uh, cannot rebuke children. They cannot say, you didn't do your homework, why? And then punish them. They say it doesn't work. Many years ago, that started in the West. That has come to Africa. And now that's not improving education. It's not making the children to learn better. It's making everything to go bad. And there are people that think that is the right thing to do. The problem of such interpreters who advocate absolute, ab absolute liberty without restraint is that they forget that God is a great judge. And if God is a great judge, there must be something that is necessary to correct, to reform, and to judge. In Hebrews chapter 12, I'm reading verse 23. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 23. To the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, which are reaching in heaven, and to God the judge of all. To God the judge of all. That means then there is judgment. You better believe there is judgment. There is judgment now and there is the judgment to come. In fact, the Bible says that the secrets of men are going to be eventually judged. Not only the actions, but the secret motive. Everything will be laid to the line and everything will be very much judged. As you look at uh, Romans chapter 2 verse 16. Romans chapter 2 verse 16. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. That's the gospel. 
the gospel of grace and yet he declares to us there's going to be judgment you see all those teachers that teach the error that there should be no judgment there should be no correction there should be no reformation there should be no teaching or training or putting anybody right they forget that jesus christ himself is the judge of the quick and the dead we're looking at acts of the apostles chapter 10 in acts chapter 10 we're looking at it from verse 40 him referring to jesus christ got raised up the third day and showed him openly not to the people but unto the witnesses chosen before of god even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead in verse 42 and he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify he christ himself the one that taught us all this in that we're reading and studying in the summer of the mount this christ himself commanded us that we should preach to the people and to testify that he is that he it is he which was ordained of god to be the judge of the quick and the dead he said don't forget to tell them in your messages who preach to them and you are my witnesses that i'm the judge of the quick and the dead that means then we need to understand the words of the lord jesus christ what is the meaning of the words of jesus judge not how do we apply these words to our personal lives in our individual families and among the brethren in the church we must consider everything jesus said and everything jesus did as well as the application of the words of jesus by his disciples in the early church that's how to understand what jesus said when he said judge not in fact that's how to understand everything jesus taught you hear the word you look at his life to see the demonstration of what he has taught and then you see the application that the disciples of jesus christ made of what he taught as we look at this study tonight titled on christ-like judgment forbidding not all judgment on christ-like judgment forbidding on charitable judgment forbidding on loving judgment forbidding but now we're dividing into three points number one is the misinterpretation of christ's words on judgment the misinterpretation there are people that misinterpret the word and they don't really do that on this verse they do it on other verses of scriptures too number one the misinterpretation of christ's words on judgment number two the model of Christ's wisdom on, in judgment. As you look at the actions of Christ, the lifestyle of Christ, the utterances and the words of Christ, you'll see the wisdom, the model of Christ's wisdom in judgment. Now, number three, the mandate. That's the command. The mandate in Christ's word on judgment. We come to number one. The misinterpretation of Christ's words on judgment. We're coming back to Matthew chapter 7. We're looking at verse 1 all over again. Here Jesus Christ in his teaching. It says, judge not that ye be not judged. You know, it's not enough to just quote the word of God. There are people that think that once you read it and you quote it, that's all. No, that's not all. Don't you remember? Satan quoted God's word to Jesus. And why did he quote the word of God? It was to persuade Christ to please the flesh. And anytime you quote the word of God so that the quotation is to lead people or to lead you to please the flesh, we know that your understanding of that word you are quoting is wrong. Number two, it was to make him worship Satan. If you quote the word of God and it's to make you worship yourself or worship people or fear people, that interpretation will be wrong. Number three, it was to make him sin against God. And anytime the scripture is quoted to you to make you sin against God, you can tell that the interpretation of that quotation will be wrong. It's not enough merely to say the word. We must know its context and the meaning and the proper application. As a general rule, any quotation of God's word, which is intended to justify wrongdoing. 
is wrong. Any quotation of God's word which is intended to cover up sin, which is intended to shut up the righteous, which is intended to pollute the lives of young people, which is intended to keep people in backsliding. Any quotation of God's word which is, uh, which is uh, you know, intended to make people careless, frivolous, sinful, evil and unrighteous, that kind of quotation will be wrong. And it said, uh, then that's the way you, you know whether somebody is interpreting the word of God aright or not. And let us see the, how, how the Pharisees, how they did it. How they misunderstood and misquoted the words of Jesus Christ. Let, let's look at uh, Matthew chapter 26 and we're looking at verse 61. Matthew chapter 26, verse 61. And said, this fellow said, what did he say? I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. That's a quotation of what Jesus said. Didn't he say that? Well, he said something similar to that. And what was the intention? It was to make him guilty before the person trying him because they brought him for crucifixion. And he said, you must condemn him. And the fellow said, but I don't see anything wrong in this man's life. I find no fault in him. You don't find any fault. But he said, this fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. That was his crime. Did he say exactly that? Let's look at John chapter 2. In John chapter 2, we will look at what he said. Now we're looking at verse 18. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? And Jesus answered and said unto them, What did he say? Did he say, I'm able to destroy this temple? You know, sometimes when you twist the word of God a little, when you change the word of God a little, when you modify the word of God a little, you're going to land on a wrong, uh, wrong conclusion. They said, he said, I'm able to destroy this temple and build it in three days. But what he said is, destroy this temple. He knew they would crucify him. That's what he meant. Destroy this temple. And in three days, I'll raise it up. And now did they understand what he said? Let's come back to Matthew. They pretended they didn't understand when they were accusing him. So they could misinterpret and misapply the word. And that's what people do. Judge not that he be not judged. They pretend they don't understand. So that they can misinterpret and misapply. Let's see now whether they understood it or not. Matthew chapter 27. And we're reading it from verse 62, Matthew chapter 27, verse 62. Now the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees came together unto Pilate saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. We remember exactly what he said. He said, after three days, I will rise again. They knew. They knew the right thing. They knew what he said. But they deliberately misquoted the word of Jesus Christ and misapplied it when they wanted to get him into trouble. That's what some people do. They corrupt the word of God. You want to be very careful that you do not allow people to blindfold you. When they want to make you do wrong. And they just say, judge not and you shall not be judged. Ask them, what does that mean? How does that apply to this situation? Are we coaching that to cover up sin? Are we coaching that to support unrighteousness? Are we coaching that to do favoritism so that we do not challenge and correct B when he's wrong, but we have challenged and corrected A when he was wrong? Why are we coaching judge not that she be not judged? 
Are we trying to worship a personality? Don't touch him. He's untouchable. Judge not that he be not judged. Is that the reason we're quoting that? The reason for the quotation can usually tell whether you're right or wrong. In 2 Corinthians, I'm reading from chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, we're looking at verse 17. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. You know, if you look at a situation today in the world, and you see many churches springing up, you'll think it's only today people are corrupting the word of God. But at the time of Paul the Apostle, many, many people were corrupting the word of God, and Paul the Apostle told the Corinthians, we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. And then we're told in Second Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3. We're looking at these people that twist, turn, change, corrupt the word of God. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 16. As also in his epistles, speaking in them of these things and the which are some things had to be understood. You know, when you read the word of God, that's all come to Bible to the Bible study. There are some things hard to be understood. And the people will take those things that are hard to be understood, they'll twist it, and then they'll change it a little, and then they'll try to blindfold you with it, and then they'll try to make you remain in sin. Don't tell anybody to judge you. Tell them to mind their business. Tell them this is none of your duty. Tell them, don't you have your own problems? Judge not. It shall not be judged. Don't tell anybody to tell you this is wrong and that is wrong. Just tell them point blank. Judge not that you may not judge. If they tell you that, you know that they're trying to just make you to remain in darkness in hell. And then it says, there are some things that to be understood. Which day that unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the scriptures unto their own destruction unto their own destruction and if we are children of god which i trust we are by the grace of god we should then make sure that we renounce all those hidden works of dishonesty we renounce all those a kind of ways in which people just quote the word so that they can shut up those who are trying to put them in the way of righteousness second corinthians chapter 4 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verses 1 and 2 Therefore seeing we have this ministry As we have received mercy we faint not But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty That means we're not dishonest anymore We look at the word of God at face value we look at what it means. We look at the application. And we do not quote the word of God to cover up our sins. We do not quote the word of God to silence people who are trying to put us in the right way. We have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. Not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. The people that do that, handling the word of God deceitfully. They don't know anything in the word of God. The only thing they know is judge not. Where is it? They don't even know. They just know there's somewhere in the Bible it says judge not. What's the context? What's the application? What's the meaning of that? I don't know. Just judge not. And it says they handle the word of God deceitfully. But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. You see the people that say judge not means you, there should be no judges or magistrates. They forget every part of the word of God. They forget that judges and magistrates are needed in the society because those magistrates and judges are ordained of God and the words judge not will not apply to them. Of course, magistrates and judges have to judge the ministers of God in that sense. In Romans chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 1. Let every soul be subject to the higher powers. For there is no power but of God, and the powers that be are ordained of 
God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that receive shall receive unto themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same for he is the minister of God to thee for good but if thou do that which is he will be afraid for he beareth not the sword in vain for he is the for he is the minister of the minister of God a revenger to execute trust upon him that doeth evil not only that, in our personal lives, we need to judge between good and evil. That is, in your personal life, you look at your life, is this good, is this right, is this wrong, is this evil, is this bad? You have to make some judgment before you make your choice. And the Lord is not saying, don't judge anything, whatever anybody presents, just take it, just accept it. Don't judge. Jesus is not saying that. Because he told them they shall watch and beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees. If you don't judge, are you going to beware of those false doctrines of the Pharisees? And he said, beware of the leaven of the Sadducees and the Pharisees. If you don't judge to know whether this is bad or this is good or this is evil, are you going to be able to get ready and then take heed? We're looking at Hebrews chapter 5 verse 14. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 14, but strong meat belongeth to them that are full age, even to those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. They have their senses exercised. They have examined things very well many times that now they know the difference between good and evil. We must also judge and discern the false prophets by their fruits. Those people that are wolves in sheep's clothing, dogs and swine, who trample the, the truth under their feet and turn again to rent and to earth, must judge and find out religious men who compass land and sea to prevail on the ignorant wanting to make them to fall children of hell more than themselves. And that means in Matthew chapter 7, the Lord is telling us, hey, don't just take everything that people say, judge. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing and inwardly they are raven in wolves. If you are just to apply, judge not unilaterally without making any difference, without knowing when it applies, when it doesn't apply. How will you know who the false prophets are? But it says, beware of those false prophets. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns, of figs, of thistles? Examine their fruit. Judge their fruit. Evaluate their fruit. Discern their fruits. In verse 17, even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down, cut down, and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. In fact, you know, it tells us that even in the church when people do wrong uh, have you ever heard of you know people they do wrong and you know they've not acted right according to the word of god and the leaders are trying to correct them put them right counsel them and uh, lead them in the way to righteousness then they just say but the bible says judge not judge not let's look at first corinthians chapter 5 1 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 3. For ver I verily as absent in the body, but present in spirit, have judged already. Judged already. Paul the apostle writing to the Corinthians. He said, I'm hearing some things coming from your area. I'm hearing some things that evil is being practiced on church. And you are puffed up. 
And I'm not sure the much and cast out that evil person from the midst of you. He said, for I verily, as I've sent in the body, I'm present with you in the spirit, and I've judged already, as though I were present concerning him that has done so done this deed. Verse 12. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? Judge them. Discern who is right, who is wrong. Discern who is righteous and who is unrighteous. And then if you have to meet out effect, church discipline, go ahead and do it. But them in verse 13, them that are without God judges. Therefore, put away from among you that wicked person. So the Lord is telling us there, we don't just fold our hands and say, judge not. Now we've seen that there are people that misinterpret and misapply the word of God. Now we want to see what's the real meaning. We come to point number two, the model of Christ's wisdom in judgment. The model of Christ's wisdom in judgment. We're looking at Matthew chapter 7 verse 1. Judge not that she be not judged. Whenever you read the words of Jesus Christ and you don't understand and you're wondering what does this mean? The next thing for you to do will be to look at the actions of Jesus Christ because the actions of Jesus Christ give us a perfect interpretation of his words. He is not a Pharisee. It was said of the Pharisees, they say and do not. But we cannot say that of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at the life of Christ and look at the message of Christ. Both will match together. His life interprets his words. His words explain his life. And that's, that's the secret of understanding the words of Jesus Christ. Because his life and his words do not contradict. They complement one another. He lived as he preached and he preached what he lived consistently before the disciples and the whole world to understand the meaning of the message of the Lord Jesus Christ when he said judge not simply observe the demonstration of those words in his life. As he commanded us to keep his words, obey his word, he also said, we well, should look at his example. Don't forget those two things, his exhortation and his example. You look at his life and you look at his words. So match those two things together. That will give you proper understanding of the word of the Lord. And let's look at John chapter 15, chapter 14, verse 15. John chapter 14, verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. Lord, how do we know the meaning? Of your commandments. How do we understand the real truth that you have preached? It says, then look at my life. John chapter 13 verse 15. John 13 verse 15. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done unto you. It said, look at my word, my exhortation. And then look at my example, my lifestyle. Compare those two things, then you will understand my meaning when I said, judge not, that she be not judged. Judge not, therefore, is uh, exemplified in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. That was his commandment. And he neither judged nor condemned the common sinners. No, his disciples. He did not excuse the sin of any sinner. Have you noticed that? He never excused sin. When there was sin, he said, this is sinful. He said, this is wrong. He wasn't judging the sinner. He was calling the sinner to repentance. We can do that. We can do that. In fact, we ought to do that. We ought to go into all the world and preach the gospel and bring sinners to repentance. And we're not judging them. That's exactly what Jesus did. He didn't judge, but he called people to repentance. In, in Luke chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 1. Luke chapter 13, verse 1. There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, 
Suppose ye that these Galileans who are sinners above all the Galileans because they suffer such things, I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. That's the truth. Sinners need to repent. I must tell the sinners repentance is the way to righteousness, to salvation, to life eternal. We're not judging them. We're just telling them the truth. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. We're not judging them. We're just telling them the truth. But if you will turn away from your sin and receive the Lord as your personal Savior, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We're not judging them. We're just telling them the way unto life eternal. Judge not, but tell them of the way to repentance. He didn't condemn them. He just said, except ye repent, ye shall not likewise perish. In verse 4, of those 18, upon whom the tower of inside Loam fell, and slew them, think ye, that they were sinners above all men that dwell in Jerusalem. I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. You see then what the Lord Jesus did. He led sinners to repentance. He warned those who came to him not to continue sinning without judging or condemning them. Look at John chapter 5 verse 14. John chapter 5 verse 14. Now judge not does not mean we cannot preach repentance. We must preach repentance. It doesn't mean we'll just pat the sinner, the backslider at the back and say, well, I'm not here to judge you. I cannot say anything about what you have done. I hear what you have done, but who am I? I cannot talk. I cannot even tell you to change, to return, to repent, to make restitution. I cannot tell you that because it says judge not. That's wrong. Jesus demonstrated his message. Judge not. But he told sinners to repent. John chapter 5 verse 14 After what Jesus findeth him in the temple And said unto him Behold thou art made whole sin no more Lest a worse sin come unto thee What you did before brought a lot of trouble in your life Don't continue doing that Sin no more Lest a worse sin come unto thee He wasn't judging him He was putting him right He was sin He was enlightening him Opening his eyes to see and to behold what you ought to behold, what you ought to know. That's what the Lord was doing in John chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 10. John chapter 8, verse 10. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto a woman, Where are those thine accusers? As no man condemned thee. And she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. What if the woman just says, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Then I can go back and do what I was doing before. Neither do I condemn thee. Don't go yet, but see no more. Go and sin no more. He wasn't judging her. Judge not, condemn not, but put them in the right way. Show them the way of righteousness. Tell them how to live a life that is glorifying to God. Judge not, but help them so they can escape the final judgment that is to come upon this world. And that's how Jesus did it. Of course, he also rebuked the disciples sharply when it was necessary. Have you ever noticed how Jesus Christ trained his disciples? You know, you cannot train people without telling them, put this one here and put this one there. Don't do it like that. Don't do it like that. If you don't do that, you're not, going to, you're not going to train anybody. People are going to remain backward if you don't tell them the right thing to do. And he trained his disciples and he told them what to do and what not to do. You know, some people, they count that as judging. They said, see, we just learned uh, these two Mondays, judge not. And yet, the same person that taught us, judge not, called on and said, why did you do it like that? Don't do that again. I thought he was telling us, judge not. Let's look at how Jesus Christ demonstrated his message. How he said, judge not, but he still trained his disciples. We're looking at Matthew chapter 16. In Matthew chapter 16, we're looking at verse 
21. Verse 21, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto the disciples how he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him. Now you must understand sometimes familiarity brings contempt. Sometimes if you are in fellowship and in love with your disciples and with those people who are following you, then they kind of think that you are equals. And then we don't know then who is a leader, who is a follower. We don't know who is a father, who is a child. We do not know who is a trainer, who is a trainee. We don't know who is the employer, who is the employee. We don't know who is the commissioner, we don't know who is the commissioned. Because everything now we, we throw down the wall of partition, we blow the lies that you know they almost remain equal. The Lord Jesus Christ was in fellowship with his disciples. And now he had been teaching them, judge not, that he may not judge. And he began to tell them that he was going to go to the cross, he was going to die. And now Peter, he had forgotten. You know, sometimes it's like that. Sometimes it's like that. You know, it's, that's, that's the carelessness of, of the human nature. The human nature, you know, if a teacher in the school loves a particular student and then has been telling the student, do this and do, it, do this, and you know, sharing with that student, you know, sometimes you can cut down the, you can you know, blow down the wall of partition. You don't know that this is a teacher and that's a student. And the student might just act familiar as if now we're equals. That the teacher is showing love doesn't mean we're equal. He's still your teacher. That the trainer is having fellowship with the trainee doesn't mean that there's no difference. It's still the trainer, the commissioner, the commission. It's, it's still has something above you. The employer still has something above the employee. Don't break down the wall. It will not help you. Now Peter, in verse 22, then Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Can you imagine that? Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord. He still called him by his title. You know, sometimes we still call the title teacher, leader, daddy, father. And even though we call the title, we still blow down the wall of difference between them. Lord, they shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto him, Get thee behind me, who? Satan. Ah, but you taught them, Judge not. I'm not judging him. I'm putting him right. I'm telling him who is speaking through him. I'm telling him if I don't go to the cross, that will be the will of Satan. I'm telling him that Satan doesn't want anybody to get saved. And if you delay me or you hinder me or disturb me from going to the cross, you'll be accomplishing the will of Satan. That's not you talking, Peter. That's Satan talking. He needed to know that that's correction. That's training. You need to train people and make them know what kind of spirit is operating in them. Get thee behind me, Satan. And then he said, because for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those things that be of man. And so the Lord is telling us then, if you are going to understand the words of Jesus, judge not. You must look at the actions of Jesus. You must look at the lifestyle of Jesus. And you must look at what he said and what he did. Look at Luke chapter 9. In Luke chapter 9, we're reading from verse, uh, from verse 51. Luke chapter 9, reading from verse 51. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should, that he should be received up. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And sent messengers before his face. And they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, 
Wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as a liar's did? Now what do you do? You just say, uh, you know, keep quiet, don't say anything, be nice to them and smile at them. Do you just pat them at the back and say, I don't want to say anything to the question you are asking because of judge not that ye be not judged. They were disciples. He was their Lord and Master. He was their teacher. He had to put them right so that after he has gone to heaven, then they will know how to do things. They will have the right attitude. They will still come across Samaria in Acts of the Apostles chapter 8. Therefore, they will need, not need to know what to do. If we don't know what to do today, if we want to do the wrong thing in Samaria today, and nobody checks us, nobody controls us, nobody puts us right, what if in a few years' time we come to that situation again? How do we know what to do? We're not judging them. We're correcting them. We're putting them right. We're telling them there are different kinds of spirits. There's a spirit of love. And there's a spirit of hatred. There's a spirit of Christ. There's a spirit of the world. There's a spirit of uh, intertribal discrimination. There's a spirit of fellowship. We need to tell them that's what he was doing. Let's look at it now. As we look at uh, that chapter 9, we're looking at verse 55. And he turned and rebuked them. Rebuke, that's not judging. It's correcting them. It's putting them right. Don't misunderstand the words of Jesus Christ. Judge not that she be not judged. To mean that you just fold your hand and you close your mouth and you just look at people and watch people, whatever they do, and they say, praise the Lord. There's no more rebuke. There's no more correction. There's no more training. Praise the Lord. Anything we do is all right because now the church is living by the principle and the word of judge not. That's misinterpretation. Look at how Jesus Christ demonstrated what he taught. We're told in this verse 55, but he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village but you know he loved his disciples that's why he trained them he did not condemn them he condemned their action but then he was loving them so that they will not incur the judgment and the wrath of God upon them Christ condemned sin in every form but he had compassion on the sinner his love and compassion for sin has made him to die for us. His hatred and condemnation for sin made him to call all sinners to repentance in clear, unmistakable language. He judged and condemned the Pharisees, had in sinners who were deceiving ignorant sinners. In the case of Pharisees, of course, he acted as a great judge. The great judge of the quick and the dead. And he told them where they were headed, where they were going. In Matthew chapter 23, I'm reading verse 33. Matthew chapter 23, verse 33. You serpents, you generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Those religious this, uh, people, they deserved that. Jesus was talking to them as the judge of the quick and the dead. And the watchman over the souls of those he came to save. And that's why we need to learn that judgment is there. And we need to judge. We need to discern. Is this right? Is this wrong? So that we'll be able to put people right and lead them in the right direction. In Matthew chapter 10, we're looking at verse 16. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Now, if you don't judge, how do you know the wolves and the sheep? How do you know the difference? You just rush into the midst of people until you are crushed, until you are destroyed, until they tear you into pieces. The Lord told them, watch and judge. Watch and look at the actions of people. If they are actually peaceful people or they are persecutors, you'll know. I send you forth a sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. It tells us in chapter 13. 
chapter 13 of Matthew. Look at verse 36. Which then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house and disciples came unto him saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tires of the field. Declare unto us, interpret unto us that teaches us something. That they have heard the parable does not mean that they understood the meaning. They said, Lord, you said something, you taught something. And you declared that parable, but we didn't understand. Can you show us, can you tell us the meaning? That means that when you read the words of Jesus, don't just pass by at that quiet time. I read the Bible. I read chapter 7 of Matthew today in my quiet time. What does it mean? Declare unto us the parable of the tears of the field. Where is the parable? Look at it from verse 24. Look at it from verse 24. Another parable put it forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field, and while men slept. Think about that. While men slept. What does that mean? It's not talking about just sleeping in the night. Yes, the parable is saying they slept in the night. And then what happened? While men slept, his enemy came and so tears among the witch and went away. All that means is for the daddy and mommy in the family, when men sleep, they just sleep and close your eyes to what the children are doing. The devil was so tears in the family. It means the church. When pastors and overseers sleep, judge not that ye be not judged. I'm not going to comment on anything that anybody does. If they put their head on the ground and put their feet in the air, I'm just going to look away when men slept. It means for the women leaders that sell these uh, women now have heard, judge not, that she be not judged. Whatever these women wear now, I know. Judge not. I'm not going to comment about anything. If they come half naked to the church, judge not, that she be not judged. When men slept, it's like, you know, the youth leaders saying, now I understand. I'm not going to give my head any, myself any headache anymore. I'm just going to leave all those young people to do whatever they want to do. They may be writing whatever kind of letters, love letters to one another in the church while we're teaching them. We're just going to keep quiet because now judge not that ye be not judged. When men slept, when you sleep, no comment again, no correction again, no rebuke again, and, and no putting anybody right again. One man slept. The enemy will come and sow tears among the weed. Don't misunderstand or misinterpret the words of Jesus and then go to sleep. That's why the disciples needed explanation, understanding of what Jesus actually taught. Look at verse, that verse 25. While men slept, his enemy came and sowed tears among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tears also. Let's come back now. And then it says in verse 28, And he said unto them, An enemy has done this. Watch and pray. Watch and teach. Watch and correct. Watch and rebuke. Watch and reprove. Don't judge. Don't be bitter. Don't get angry. Don't keep malice. Don't put anybody into eternal hell. Don't judge, don't condemn, but correct them. Put them right. Don't sleep. Don't just say, forget about it. No more correction, no more training. Discipleship needs training. Correct them. That they still need to be righteous and holy. I don't say, well, there's no point correcting anybody. In fact, I've had it now. Judge not that you may not judge. I want to have peace of mind. 
Oh, you are going to destroy your family if you do that. You are going to destroy your company if you do that. You are going to destroy the church if you do that. And let's go back to this. Verse 37 now. He answered and said unto them, He that sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the wall. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. And the tares are the children of the wicked one. The children of the wicked one. Uh, you know how sinners come into the rank and file of the workers in the church when leaders slept. That any kind of workers just come in, their lives, their attitude, their behavior, their character, their conduct, just shows that they are not born again. But you know, judge not. Who am I to judge? I hear that so and so is smoking and drinking. Well, why don't you just leave them? Who knows? Since the Bible says, judge not. While leaders slept, sinners will come into the rank and file of the workers. The Lord is not telling us to break down every discipline and break down every norm, every standard. When he said judge not, it just means don't be bitter in your heart. Don't be critical. Be a father. Be a teacher. Be a leader. Be a trainer that will lead people in the right way. And do not get angry at them. Just teach them. Judge not. Don't be bitter against them. And then be patient with them. Why did you do this? Why did you do that? This is why I didn't know you shouldn't do that. A child of God who said is born of God does not commit sin. Now don't you see this is backsliding? Alright now please go and pray. You say that without anger. You love them and you want them to go the right direction. You are not judging them. You are putting them through. That's how Jesus did it. That's how we are going to do it. And the Lord will help us in Jesus name. You know, we need to clear up all these things. Otherwise, there's some people that hear only one verse of scripture. They don't hear the whole meaning. Then they run away with it and they destroy their lives. We come to point number three now. The mandate in Christ's words on judgment. The mandate in Christ's words on judgment. Matthew chapter 7. We're looking at verses 1 and 2. Judge not that he be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, it shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Now look at, you know, what he's saying in chapter 6 of Luke. Luke chapter 6, verse 37. Luke chapter 6, we're looking at verse 37. Judge not, that ye be not judged. Condemn not and you shall not be condemned. That's what he's saying. Condemn not. Neither do I condemn you, but go and sin no more. What's your language? Oh, you're correcting somebody. My brother, this is not right. Or do you think this is the way to do this sin? Can't you do better than this? Can't we glorify God with our lives, with our actions? What do you think this example will show the people? Don't you think God, is, we're not giving God the best when we do it like this. And Don't you see we're not glorifying Christ and Calvary. If we continue to live like this, we're not condemning them. You're asking them questions. You're reasoning together. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. That's not judging. You're not condemning them. And then it says forgive and you shall be forgiven. And when the people I see it now. That's not the right thing. I see it now. I shouldn't have. No, that's all. That's all right now. Then you forgive. You are not judging. You are putting them right. John chapter seven, verse twenty-four. John chapter seven. We're looking at verse twenty-four. John chapter seven, verse twenty-four. Judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Those are the words of Jesus. Judge not according to appearance. Something has happened. It appears to be like this. Don't comment yet. Don't be hasty. Don't be rash. Don't jump into conclusion. Call the person. How about this? 
What's the motive for this? What's the reason for this? What's the background thinking or thoughts that produce this action? And then you can now tell after analyzing everything and you judge righteous judgment. Look chapter 12, we're looking at verse 57. Luke chapter 12, verse 57. Yea, and why even of yourselves judge not ye what is right? That's the, those are the words of Christ. The Lord says, why don't you judge which one is right? Which one is proper? Which one is appropriate? Why don't you judge and discern which one is acceptable? And that's what the Lord is telling us. He's telling us we need to judge. And when we judge, we're not criticizing them. We're putting them right. In a personal relationship, one with another. In the, in the fellowship with the brethren. Our Lord has commanded us not to judge one another. But we can admonish one another. Don't judge but admonish. Don't judge but teach. Don't judge but counsel. We're looking at Colossians chapter 3 verse 16. Colossians chapter 3. We're looking at verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. Teaching and admonishing one another. What's admonishing? Instructing one another. Correcting one another. Training one another. Enlightening one another. Exhorting one another. Not only that, we can counsel and correct we're looking at Malachi chapter 3, verse 16. Malachi chapter 3, verse 16. It says, Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. They spoke often one to another. Brother, it looks like you are not praying enough. We're not judging them. We're speaking one to another. Are you getting ready for the coming of the Lord? We're not judging them. We're speaking one to another. Has your family life? Ah, have you resolved the problems you had in your family the other time? Is there more understanding, more love, and more care now in the family? We're not judging. We're speaking one to another. And the Lord hacking and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. Not only that, we counsel and correct. Not only that, we exhort and we'll watch over one another. We exhort, we'll watch over one another. How can you watch over somebody if you don't ever comment if that person is doing wrong? That fellow is going the way of the backslider. Just say, judge not. I'm not going to tell him. You see him going to fall into the pit of backsliding and falsehood and error. I'm not going to judge, I'm not going to comment. That's not the attitude of a real loving concern, brother or sister. We're told in uh, Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 12. Hebrews chapter 3. We're reading from verse 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. In departing from the living God. And if you see your brother wanting going astray. His attitude is changing to the Bible. His statue to the church is changing. And then he's missing fellowship. And I just say, well, the Bible says, judge not. I have my own shortcoming. I have my own kind of a weaknesses. I'm not going to judge. Are you going to help them? Verse 13. But exhort one another daily. Challenge one another daily. Help one another daily. Stop one another daily. While it is called today. Lest any of you be hiding through the deceitfulness of sin. You don't want people to be deceived and then just remain in sin. We need to teach and edify one another. Don't judge but teach. Don't judge but edify. Don't judge but make them grow. Don't judge but make them desire to climb higher in spiritual things. Romans chapter 14. We're looking at verse 19. Romans 14, 19. Let us therefore follow after that which, after the things which make for peace and the things wherewith we may edify another. Edify another. 
now uh, look at Luke chapter 17 from verse 3 Luke chapter 17 from verse 3 we even have to rebuke one another no, don't judge but rebuke rebuke and he's not even talking about the leader in the church rebuking members he's talking about member to member he's saying how could you do that this is wrong how could you go that direction you shouldn't do that are we not pilgrims to the way of heaven? Why are we doing like this? We must rebuke one another. Luke chapter 17 verse 3. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. Those are the words of Christ. So you don't just take the words of Christ. Judge not that he be not judged. And then you see your brother is doing something against you. He's paining you and pinching you and oppressing you. And you're feeling the heavy weight of what this brother, this sister is doing. Okay, judge not. There's bitterness in your heart. Judge not. You're all thinking you cannot sleep at night. How could my brother say that to me? But I'm not going to talk to him. Judge not. And you are dying in silence. Don't do that. Jesus himself said, Take heed to yourselves. If your brother trespass against you, rebuke him. If he repent, forgive him. Not only that, we're even to report. Report. You see, there are people that you see things going wrong and they just go their way. It doesn't matter to them because the Bible says, judge not. And since the Bible says, judge not, and it's in, even if the roof is going to come down, I don't care, I don't worry. All I know is, judge not. That's not the good interpretation of the word of God. First Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. First Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. It is reported. It is reported, it is reported commonly among you that there is fornication. Such fornication as is not as so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. You know some people, I'm not going to be the source of anybody being disciplined. I'm not going to be the source of anybody being openly rebuked. They have, uh, in fact, the Bible even says, judge not. What's my problem in that? And what's my concern if that fellow is, you know, committing whatever? How can I judge? Do I know the details? Do I know this and do I know that? Therefore, I'll keep quiet. The Lord will judge you also for seeing the destruction of the life of somebody and then keeping quiet and under the cover of judge not. That she be not judged. You're misinterpreting, applying the word of God. Report. Look at that again. Chapter 5, verse 1. And eventually this report made the fellow to be excommunicated. Discipline. So, so definitely. They are trying to send him out of the church. But some people say, I'm not going to be the cause of that. Why? Because the Bible says, judge not. You read the Bible upside down. You read only one verse. You didn't read the rest of the Bible. It's reported commonly that there is fornication among you and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one shall have his father's wife. Chapter 1 verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 11. For it has been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are the house of Chloe. That there are contentions among you. Paul the apostle said, Corinth had the report. The house of Chloe, they wrote to me. Thank God that's not anonymous letter. You know some people, are, they are cowards, they are fearful, they are not bold for the truth. They are not bold for righteousness. That's why they write anonymous letters. Something is happening in that district. It's terrible. Pastor, you better look at that uh, district. I cannot mention names. and I don't want to write my name. I'm the one making this report. All I want to do is just alert you. If you send people there, they'll come and tell you the real thing. But something is going on there. Pastor, you must, you must uh, take action immediately. But who are you? I don't know. Anonymous letters. Those are useless letters. But the house of Chloe, they were bold for righteousness. And they were bold for the truth. 
And they wrote to Paul the apostle. They said, Paul, they said, what is happening in Corinth? When you correct it, mention our names. That we were the people that made the report. Those were the people, they wanted the good of the church of the living God. That, that's why it says, for it has been declared, reported unto me of you. My brethren, by them which are the house of Chloe, that... There are contentions among you. The Lord is telling us then that, you know, these are the things to do. And it is not that we are judging them. We just want the best from them. And the Lord is bringing us back and is saying, now you understand. Let's come back to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, we're looking at verses 1 and 2. Judge not, but correct other people. Judge not, but rebuke them if it's necessary. Judge not, but put them right. Judge not, but teach repentance. Judge not, but help them to discover the way of life. Judge not, that ye be not judged. With what judgment ye judge? If a judge with bitterness and with hatred, with that same judgment, bitterness, and hatred, other people, People will judge you for and with what measure ye meet it shall be measured to you again we have learned quite a lot and we need to tell the Lord oh Lord we have learned something look at Job chapter 34 Job chapter 34 and if we have been misunderstanding misapplying misinterpreting the word of God we tell the Lord we are not going to misinterpret his word anymore now we know the truth and we know the implication and the meaning of what Jesus Christ is revealing unto us it's says in Job chapter 34 verse 31 surely it is me to be said unto God I have borne chastisement I will not offend anymore that which I see not teach thou me that's what the Lord has been doing he's been telling us what we didn't understand about judge not that which I see not teach me teach thou me if I've done iniquity misinterpreted your word or misapplied your word misunderstood your word I will do no more amen Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. That the Lord will help us to keep the word of God balanced in our heart. Balanced in our heart. Balanced. Judge not. Don't be bitter. Don't be angry. And don't be cruel. Don't be merciless. But correct other people. Challenge other people. Exhort other people. Stir up the minds of other people to holiness and righteousness. Put them through. Put them right. While men slept. When leaders sleep. When daddies sleep. When mommies sleep. When zonal leaders and coordinators sleep. When overseers sleep. And you only want to be sugar daddy, sugar mommy. Thinking that you love everybody when they're doing wrong. You cannot put them right. Judge not that ye be not judged. And they're going more and more into evil. Bad characters becoming terrible habit on them. Because you misunderstand, judge not that ye be not judged. When leaders sleep, they don't rebuild, they don't correct, they don't report. Only anonymous letters that carry no weight. But if you can be bold for righteousness and bold for holiness and then do everything in love, you do everything without fear, you do everything. Because you have an intention of purifying the lives of your brother and sister. And you want the church to be stronger, to be purer, to be holier. And you have a good intention. You are not critical. You are not watching for faults. You are not watching for the downfall, for the discipline of anyone. But you want holiness. You want righteousness. And if somebody is manifesting the spirit of Satan... You don't want to hide that. Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. He wasn't judging. He was telling him, that thought, that language, that counsel is motivated by Satan. Peter, you don't want to do that. You don't want to submit yourself to the hands of Satan. That's what he was telling him. 
And you will, you will have to tell people, brother, is that of God or is that of Satan? That action, that utterance, that attitude, that disposition, that plan, is that of God or is that of Satan? You need to put them right, but don't be bitter against them. Don't hate them. Just correct them in love. Correct them in love. Because you want them to get to heaven. And you challenge them to repent. You say it lovingly, but you say it firmly. You say it with compassion, but you say it with conviction. While men slept, when pastors and overseers become so soft, or maybe it's because we're becoming timid, we don't want to suffer, then we sleep, artificial sleep. We act as if we are asleep, as if we don't know something is going wrong. And then we hide under the words, judge not. Are you sure you are interpreting it right? Or are you afraid of persecution? Afraid of the reactions of sinners and backsliders? While men slept, the enemies came and so tears in the field. Then all your work will be destroyed. Because those children of Satan, the children of the wicked one, if you allow them, they're going to corrupt and destroy the children of the kingdom. Don't sleep. Wake up. Stop yourself. Challenge believers to righteousness. Don't judge. But exhort them. Preach to them. Emphasize the truth. Don't judge. Don't be bitter. Don't be angry. Don't condemn. But preach. Preach the truth. And lead the people to righteousness. Don't be timid. Don't be fearful. Take a little fire, a little suffering, a little pressure, a little opposition. Take a little frown. Don't be afraid. Don't be so much afraid of children of the devil. You allow them to sow tears in the field. Don't judge all the same. Don't be bitter. Don't condemn. Mind your language. Mind your attitude. Don't get angry. But be firm. Preach the truth with conviction. With love, with firmness and conviction. Judge not. But rebuke them. That they may be sound in the face. Don't beat the youths. Don't carry cane in your hand. Apply the rod of the word. The rod of correction. There's nothing that corrects more effectively than the word of truth. Don't beat them. Don't abuse them. Don't insult them. Don't get angry. Judge not. Don't be critical. Love them, but put them right. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he shall not depart from it. Train them. Don't say, well, the Bible says, judge not. So hands down. No correction, no rebuke, no challenge, no inspiration. Inspire them. Show them the way to climb up and the way to improve, the way to live. Pastors, if you need to discipline anyone in the church, don't rush, don't be harsh, don't be angry, don't act as if you had been looking for a chance to do it, to whip somebody. But when you have to do it, do it anyhow. Do it in love. It has to be done. Do it. Don't let the church be a church of indisciplined people. Don't judge, but discipline them. Correct them. 
If they have to go out of service, put them out of service for some time. Men whose mouths must be stopped, do it. But don't hate, don't do it on tribal sentiments, but do it when it has to be done. And don't be afraid of anybody, don't be partial. Have a uniform standard of the word of God. Warn the unruly. Prepare people for heaven. Remember, 